Thank you, John. We appreciate the opportunity to partner with Harvey Cedars. This is our 16th year uh, serving with you guys, our 20th year as the Nightlights team. And uh, we thank you for allowing us to uh, work with your children. We thank you even more for taking them back. Uh, but thank you so much. We are going to highlight some of the things that we were learning this week. I'm going to ask the seven young people that have a part in the program this morning to please come up here. So let's have those seven make, go, go ahead and make your way up here. Our program this year was called Signs. The tagline said, God is speaking, are you listening? We were talking about how God goes out of his way to communicate his love uh, for, his, for his creation. More than anything else, God wants to have an intimate relationship with each of us. And so these young people are going to share with you some of the main truths that we had learned in our Bible lessons as well as the Bible verses that went along with that. And we will begin with Damaris. And she's going to let us know that one of the reasons that God gives his signs is to... Remind us of promises he's already made. In 1 Kings 8.56 it says, Praise be to the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel, just as he promised. Not one word has failed of all the good promises he gave through his servant Moses. 1 Kings 8.56. Very good. Thank you. Right now, little Lucy is going to tell you about another reason that God has given us his signs. Sometimes God gives us his signs to... Express loving patience to help his children strengthen in their faith. Mark 9.24, Mark 9.24b. I do believe, help me overcome my unbelief. Mark 9.24b. Very good. Right now, Hannah is going to share with us another one of those reasons. Reasons Sometimes God's promises are given to... To serve as a warning that encourages re repentance. 2 <laughs> Peter 3.9, the Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. He is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Very good. 2 <laughs> Peter 3.9. The young Daniel Kletzing is going to share another one of those reasons. Sometimes God's signs are given to... Authenticate the work that he is doing in the lives of his children. Galatians 5, through 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Without such things there is no law. Very good. Galatians 5, and 23. All the way from England, we have a young British lady. She was talking to me in British earlier today. I'm not sure what was going on there. We have young Evelyn, who is going to give us another reason. Sometimes God has given us his signs to... Prepare people for the amazing work that he has yet to do. Matthew 24, 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. Matthew 24, 14. Very good. Thank you. And in addition to the verses that went with each of the Bible lessons, we had a theme verse this year. And we have Naomi, who is going to give us this year's theme verse. Romans 1, 20. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, and of divine nature have been clearly seen being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse romans 1 20. very good thank you naomi god is the author of both his word and his work science done correctly will always support what scripture has clearly shown us and finally we have a sister act sister sister you're not here to no you want to hear them sing not me but we also had a bonus verse this year, and we have Abby and Jordan who are going to give us this year's bonus verse. Psalm 33, 4. For the word of the Lord is right and true. He is faithful in all he does. Psalm 33, 4. 
Very good. Give these young people a round of applause. You guys may go back to your families. Thank you so much. Uh, if you want to catch up with us, you can see us there in the back before you head out. We are, we're thanking the Lord for a great week. There was a young man that did something very amazing uh, earlier this week. He's been to the program a couple of years, but this week he prayed to ask the Lord Jesus to be his Savior. And we give God glory for that. And, uh, yeah, give God a praise. Good. Some of, you, some of you were accustomed to giving God praise for that, and some of you are like, are we allowed to thank God for that in church or not? Yes, we are allowed to, yes. And uh, so our desire is that all of us who have embraced the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, that we will be those living signs, those walking billboards that point people to the Lord. Thank you, John. Hey, what do you say? We stand up, stretch our arms, our hearts and minds and our souls, and worship the Lord this morning, all right? On an emotional level, at first, it didn't really sink in. And I think a lot of people that are close to an event like that, you know, you're kind of in a sort of a dream state for a little bit. You're kind of trying to figure out what happened and, and, uh, I finally started to piece it all together uh, later on that evening. And when he finally did get a hold of me, he, he just kept saying, it wasn't me. Don't worry, it wasn't me. Uh, well, I've been with American Airlines since 1991, so we're coming up on my 20th anniversary with American. Uh, I've been a pilot a little bit longer than that. I was first uh, employed by the Navy. I flew P-3s. Uh, out of Brunswick, Maine, and uh, I was on active duty for eight years. I got about 3,500 hours of P3 uh, time in those eight years, uh, and then I got hired by American Airlines, and uh, currently I fly the Boeing 757 and 767 airplanes. It's interesting because you don't know what's going to happen September 11th when you're living September 10th, and I just remember September 10th because S September in New England is beautiful. It's not quite fall, but it's, it's cooler than it would be other places. And I'd taken them to the library and I was sitting outside drinking a coffee while they were in the library. And for the first time really thanking the Lord because I felt safe. I thought, wow, we're all here and it's safe. And what in the world could ever happen in Georgetown, Maine? September 10th is a date that means you know, a great deal to me because uh, I did what I normally do on uh, September 10th. The day before I become available to go flying and my flying is in blocks of days of availability. So I was available to go flying on September 11th. So at about 3 o'clock in the afternoon on September 10th, I sat down at the computer and I, I logged in like I normally do and to check to see if there was any unassigned flying for the next day. And sure enough, there was one trip that was available on September 11th. It was American Airlines uh, Flight 11 out of Boston's Logan Airport uh, to Los Angeles. It was a two-day trip, got back on the second day left, I think, at about, I don't know, 7.40, 7.45 in the morning, something around that time frame. Uh, and I looked at it, and there was no uh, pilot assigned to it yet. So the next thing that, I, that what I do is I go and check and see uh, if there's any reserve pilots available. Now, I know I'm available, but there might be some other guys available. And it just so happened on September 11th, 2001, uh, there was only one guy available to go flying on that day, and that was me. So I've been through this drill a lot of times over the years. Uh, I went and I, I, in fact, I told my wife, I said, um, I said, I'm going to Los Angeles tomorrow. Uh, I went out to the car and I opened up the trunk and I got my, my uh, dirty luggage out of the trunk and I threw it in the wash machine and I packed my bags with the new clean stuff and took it back out to the car and I said, I'm going to LA. And at three o'clock in the afternoon, uh, in fact, in those days, uh, what's called crew scheduling at American Airlines would actually assign my name to that trip. I ironed his shirt, which I always do, and put his epaulets on his shoulder and found the ID and, you know, made sure he had everything packed he needed. And we just prepare. When you're a, um, when you're a military family, you prepare in a certain way. When you're an airline family, it's the same thing. There's just a routine and kind of a checklist you go through to prepare for dad to leave on a trip. The, the final assignment comes via the phone call. So they make you know, positive contact communication with you. It's not just in the computer. They'll call and they'll say, hey, we want to let you know you've been assigned a trip. 
Now, I, I might know that already by looking into the computer. I could already see that. But uh, a real person will call you and say, Scheibner, it's now your trip. And now at that point, once you have that phone conversation, even a, if a line pilot wants to, they can't bump you off that trip. So they've only got a 30-minute window of opportunity. Once that phone call gets made, it's a done deal. I waited for the phone call, and the phone never rang, um, which is not completely unusual. It's not the norm, but it's not completely out of the question either. In fact, I didn't even think about it for a while. Uh, it was later on that evening, I thought, hey, you know, they never assigned that trip to me. And then I really didn't give it another thought because, well, what that means is I still get paid, but I've got, I've got tomorrow off. I'm still available to go flying, but they, you know, they never finalized an assignment, so I guess I can, you know, brush off my ambitions to do something else that day. What was taking place, uh, unaware, I was unaware of, uh, was the fact that a, a fellow by the name of Tom McGinnis, uh, who was one of those line-holding pilots, a little bit senior to me, uh, Tom was celebrating his birthday on September 10th with his wife and his children. And Tom did what I did that afternoon, about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. He went over to the computer, and he logged in, and he looked, and he saw that that flight was open, but my name had been penciled in. And he knew he was in, still in that 30-minute window of opportunity. Uh, so Tom called down to American Airlines and said, hey, you know, I just want to check with you. Am I legal to take this trip? In other words, can I bump Scheibner off that trip? And uh, they did what they do with the computer down there, and they got back to him and said, yep, you're, you're legal for that trip, but you've got to give us a call back in the next, you know, 20 minutes, uh, or else we're going to finalize the assignment. I assume that Tom had some sort of conversation with his wife, uh, and he called back. He called American Airlines, and he said, yeah, I'll take that trip. So at that moment, they erased my name off the trip. They assigned it to Tom. I didn't know any different because they never called. And uh, Tom showed up for work that day on September 11th. As you recall, on the East Coast, it was a beautiful day that day. They pushed back off the gate on time, and uh, they took off on time, and they, uh, Tom was actually flying. It was his leg to Los Angeles that day. And uh, they flew up to about 23,000 feet, and Tom engaged the autopilot to take him the rest of the way to Los Angeles. And at that moment, uh, all hell broke loose on the airplane. I mean, there's not another way to, to express it. The cockpit's not answering. Somebody's stabbed in business class. And um, I think there's mates that we can't breathe. I, I don't know. I think we're getting hijacked. Which flight are you on? Flight 12. Flight 12. Okay. No, we're on flight 11 right now. This is flight 11. It's flight 11. I'm sorry, Nitty. Boston to Los Angeles. Yes. And what seat are you in? Ma'am, are you there? Yes. What, what? What seat are you in? Ma'am, what seat are you in? We just left Boston. We're up in the air. I know. We're what? supposed to go to L.A., and the cockpit's not answering their phone. We're okay, but what seat four. are you sitting in? What's the number of your seat? Okay, I'm in my jump seat right now. Okay. At 3R. Okay, you're the flight attendant? Our number one has been stabbed, and our five has been stabbed. Can anybody get up to the cockpit? Can anybody get up to the cockpit? Okay, we can't even get into the cockpit. We don't know who's up there. Is anybody still there? Yes, we're still here. Okay. I'm staying on the line as well. Okay. What's going on, honey? Okay, the aircraft is erratic again. Bottom, very erratic. Ready, talk to me. Ready, are you there? Ready? have a TV on, I didn't have a radio on, we were just doing our schoolwork and, um, and pretty soon the, the head contractor called me. Um, his guys had called him because they realized that Steve wasn't home and he called me and said, you know, where is Steve today? And I said, well, he's in, at the Navy. He had gone to work for the Navy that day since he didn't get an airline trip. And it, the problem with the contractors was they were scared. They thought he had been on that flight and they were going to be dealing with this distraught woman who had just lost her husband. Um, it really started to come home to me, the emotional gravity of what happened when my cell phone started to ring. But uh, 
a secretary at an, a school that I used to attend uh, looked up my cell phone number. She was the first person to call. And uh, I answered the phone, and uh, Evie was on the end of the phone, and she heard my voice and she started crying. And uh, when she started crying, I, I started crying. And uh, so uh, she was just happy to hear my voice. And it wasn't two minutes after I got off with her that somebody else called, friends of ours from down in Texas. And I thought, you know, I, I need to get ahead of this and make some phone calls. So I, I called home and I, I called to different places. I still didn't realize that that was the flight that I was supposed to be on. You know, I'm watching it on TV like everybody else. And it didn't click with me. I knew the flight number and everything. It still didn't click with me. When it finally clicked with me was later on that evening. I thought, you know, I wonder who was on that flight. And I thought, well, maybe I can go find out the names because the media wasn't going to give you the names for a few days. I thought maybe there's a way through the login process at American to find out the names. And so I did. I did what I did the day before on September 10th. I logged in. And when the screen came up in front of me, it looked exactly like it did the day before when it had that trip and it had my name penciled in. Except this time, it had this trip sequence. My name wasn't there, and it said these three words, sequence, failed, continuity. That's code at the airlines for the trip never made it to its destination. Wow, what an understatement. <laughs> sequence, failed, continuity. And at that moment, when I got that visual look at the screen, I was overwhelmed. It, uh, I, I said, you know what? I packed my bags to go on that trip. And then I was even more curious at who had bumped me. But uh, the words can't describe th that moment of, of realizing that you should have been someplace. And you asked me about guilt a little while ago. Yeah, you do have a twinge of guilt. 20 years ago, I wrote a life objective. And my life objective goes like this. It's to seek, trust, and glorify God through humble service and continual prayer to raise up qualified disciples as quickly as possible so that someday I might hear God say, well done, my good and faithful servant. The events of September 11th took that life objective that I already had and it intensified it for me. The fire just keeps getting hotter as I get older. But someday I want to stand in the Lord's presence and I want him to say, well done. I would hate to get in God's presence and have him say, oh yeah, Scheibner, I see your name's down here. Well, you know, have a seat. I need to hear the Lord say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That's what's on my plate, and that's what's driving me these days. Um, why does God take one and, and leave another? It's not because um, I'm a better person or God wanted to do more with me than he wanted to with Tom. I, I think in God's providence, uh, that's obviously his choice. What has stuck with me all these years is the fact that he did leave me behind is that I need to act like I'm living on borrowed time, because I am. I can look and see my smoking hole, and it was on national TV. And I saw where I should have died, but I didn't. And now, there's an obligation that comes with that. I've got to live my days with a sense of urgency. I have to make sure I get the most out of them, and not the most for me. That's I think we, we live in a world where everybody's kind of out to get the most for them. This is not about me. This is about the distinct privilege I've been given to know that somebody died in my place. What I know is that somebody died in my place not once, but twice. That's where God comes into the whole thing for me. See, Tom sat in a seat that I was qualified to sit in. And, and by all rights, I, that was my seat that day. I should have been in that seat. In fact, I've sat in the very seat of that airplane that Tom was in. I've flown all of the, the 757s and 767s American Airlines own. So I know what it's like literally to sit in that seat. But I am still, all these years later, still qualified to sit in that seat. And I could have. But Tom didn't die for my sins. 
You see, God sent his own son to die for my sins. Jesus Christ was the other one who died in my place, and he hung, and he bled, and he suffered on a cross to pay a price for me that I wasn't qualified to pay. I couldn't have hung on the cross. I didn't have the same qualifications. So one guy sat in a seat that I should have sat in, the other hung and bled on the cross. One is far more significant than the other. That's not to trivialize what happened to Tom. It's to elevate um, and glorify what God did for me and you know, for mankind on the cross. We'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, uh, I've seen that film 500 times, uh, and I always watch people watching the film. And uh, I still get choked up. I think that's a sign of a really well-made film. You can watch it over and over again. You still have the same reaction to it. And uh, when the filmmaker takes you up on the airplane, and, and Betty, the flight attendant, is talking to the people on the ground, and there's all that confusion back and forth, it's hard for me to hear Betty's voice. I knew Betty. Betty was a friend of mine. You see, Betty wasn't just somebody on a, on a film or a recording. To me, she was somebody that was real, and, and uh, it, what a courageous lady. Uh, if you think about what was going on with Betty that day, um, she was scared to death, but she'd been ushered to the back of the airplane uh, like everybody else, and uh, back in those days, uh, at least at American Airlines, um, on some of the airplanes, we had telephones at some of the seats, and uh, they don't have them on the airplanes anymore, not because uh, of 9-11, uh, but they don't have them anymore because nobody wanted to pay $7 a minute to make a phone call, or, more importantly, sit next to somebody else who was, okay? So it was just very annoying for people, and they, they took them off the airplanes. But back in those days, they had them, so Betty had grabbed one of those phones, run her own personal credit card, and called down to American Airlines and said, hey, i got to tell you what's going on, right? But you know what's going to happen to Betty if the terrorists find her on the phone, right? So she's, she's gathering data and trying to relay it to what's going on, on the ground. Meanwhile, she hears that two friends of hers have been stabbed up in first class, and it, it's just, what a courageous lady. It's just hard... Uh, hard to hear her voice, and, and there's that moment in that dialogue with her and the people on the ground where it, it's the reality of what's going on sinks in, and there's that long pause. We didn't make that any longer. That was the real long, it's called a pregnant pause, and there's that real long pause, and then, you know, Betty comes back and says, is anybody still there? <laughs> Everybody on the ground realizes the gravity of what's going on at that moment. Uh, it's hard to hear her voice. Uh, now, before I jump into what old Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story, um, I want to share with you just a couple of administrative things. So one is um, character health counseling. We talked about that over the week, and uh, several of you have signed up, and I'm going to reach out to you uh, the, in the week coming up, um, just saying, starting the dialogue, starting the conversation about whether you're going to come and see us or not. And uh, I had a couple people say, well, why, you know, why, why would I do that? Why would I come for a weekend of counseling? You know? Well, my question would be, why would you ever go see the doctor? I mean, until you get really, really, really sick. I'm, I'm talking like you're on deathbed, and then you might go see the doctor. You go to see the doctor to tune things up, right? And if you're getting a little sick and you can see it coming, that's when you go see the doctor. You don't wait until it's, uh, you know, beyond help. And so uh, please come back and, and fill this out if, uh, if you're even close to that. Uh, we'd love to have a conversation with you and help. That's all. All right, and the other two things are this. Um, there is the film that you just saw, and uh, I, I love the personal touch still. Uh, and so if you're watching that film and you're thinking uh, maybe there's a friend or a neighbor or a coworker or somebody that you wish had just seen that film, it's that person you've been praying for for some time that's probably never going to go to church with you. You know who I'm talking about? 
and uh, they've been on your heart for many years, but they're not going to go to church, um, grab a copy of this DVD and hand it out to them this week and say, hey, I caught this guy's story. It's the 20th anniversary this year. Uh, watch the film, and then a few days later, follow up with that person. I think what you're going to find out is this little film will open up the door to a conversation that you've been praying would open up for a long time. All right? So take me up on that. And, and uh, we've got stacks and stacks of that back there. And the other is the book. It's called In My Seat. Uh, and Megan, that, uh, the fair and lovely Megan, you got to see her for the first time. The fair and lovely Mrs. Scheibner uh, wrote this book. And it's really uh, an incredibly good book. We've sold more of these than we've sold of anything else back there uh, on the table. And uh, like I said, reading one of Megan's books like having a cup of coffee with your best friend. Um, she gives you some insight about 9-11 uh, and then what God was doing with our lives building up to that catalytic moment and then what he's done with us and forming our ministry after that. Um, I'm just going to read to you one real quick excerpt out of the book because there's that moment uh, where uh, we're talking about the phone not ringing and how kind of unusual that was for our family. And Megan picks up on that moment. She calls it the sleep of the unaware. And here's what she says. She says, the no phone call wasn't completely unheard of for our family. In Steve's time at American Airlines, there had been about three times that we prepared for him to leave, and the phone never rang. Sometimes we wishfully joke, perhaps you'll get bumped from your trip and be able to hang out with us today, but usually that just didn't happen. For us, no phone call meant more time with Dad, and he'd still get paid. Not a bad deal. So that evening, back into the closet went the airline uniform, and instead we prepared Steve's Navy uniform. The unexpected day off from the airlines provided an opportunity to spend time working on the Navy base. Again, I ironed another uniform and made sure his insignia were in place. Now with a firm plan for Tuesday the 11th, we tucked the kids in bed and headed upstairs ourselves. 45 minutes away, Muhammad Atta spent the evening in a rented hotel room. No family dinner for him. Instead, he went to the local pizza hut and then returned to his room, eager to perform his prescribed rituals in anticipation of the next day's events. While we slept in Georgetown, Maine, Muhammad Atta stayed awake, fueling his hatred and evil plans in Portland, Maine. In a hotel that we passed on uh, each trip to the big city of Portland, Steve's would-be assassin made his final preparations, and yet we slept peacefully. I can only speculate about what was going on in the McGinnis household that evening. Their lives looked so much like ours on paper, Military background, airline pilot, active in their church. I picture them going through the same pre-trip rituals that Steve and I performed. I'm sure Tom was in bed early. He'd have to be at Logan first thing Tuesday morning to pre-flight the airplane for Flight 11 to Los Angeles. Like us, they would sleep the sleep of the unaware. Unaware that Monday night would be their final family night together. Unaware that Tom's 42nd birthday would be his last. Unaware that life as they knew it was about to change forever. And it goes on from there. You see, September 11th, 2001 is what I call a major life event. It's one of those moments where your brain takes a little snapshot of exactly where you were. And you, now you have to be of a certain age to have that snapshot of 9-11. If you're less than 28 years old or so, you probably don't have that little snapshot inside your brain. I just showed you how old I am, right? I keep doing this. Right? All the young people are going, what is that? All right, it's called, it's, it used to be called a camera. It's, it never, it's a long story. But anyway, uh, it, it, you know, you, you look it up in a history book. So, but your brain's got one of those inside of it, okay? And it takes a, it takes a selfie at that moment. And, uh, and, and, there, and there you are. And I think God puts that little, that little camera inside of our brains for a reason. And the reason is this. Every once in a while in life, uh, you need to just stop and focus on that which is most important and exclude that which is least important. Isn't that true? Right? In a sense, that's what we do when we come to church on Sunday, right? Once a week, the Lord said, come and worship me. Let's start the week out. By the way, Sunday's the first day of the week, not the last. All right? We get confused about that. Sunday's the first day of the week. Let's start our week out right by coming and worshiping me. Let's focus on that which is most important and exclude all the other stuff. It'll all be there when you go home. Don't worry. But let's focus on me right now. And that, that's going to get your week started out the right way. And so that's what we do, right? And so God put that little snapshot inside my brain and inside of yours for a reason. And, uh, uh, you know, we, I have other snapshots inside my brain. That's not the only major life event I've ever had, but there's not many of them. My very first childhood memory was when John F. Kennedy was assassinated. That's how old I am. I was three years old at the time. That's pretty young to have a, a memory. And I was three years old, but I remember my parents standing in front of their old 19-inch black-and-white Philco TV with the, the rabbit ears, and it was on a, a TV stand. And uh, there they were, and tears were coming down their face, and it was the funeral of the president. 
Yeah, and I can remember that just like it was yesterday, very vivid. I remember where I was when Reagan was shot and the space shuttle Challenger blew up and, you know, all those kind of things from history. And uh, they, they leave an indelible mark on your mind. So before we jump into what old Paul Harvey used to call the rest of the story here, uh, let's, uh, I, I get asked two questions primarily. And the two questions I, I get asked over the last now 20 years are, number one, how do you like flying airplanes? And, and number two, why do you think God spared your life or how has your life changed since the events of 9-11? Kind of the same question. And uh, the, the first question is a whole lot easier to answer than the other. I, I love flying airplanes. Uh, most pilots will tell you they love what they do for a living. I, I can't believe I get paid to stare out the window of an airplane, but I do. It's a pretty good gig uh, when you think about it. I've been doing it for a lot of years. But I, I got to be honest with you. It gets a little boring staring out the window. In fact, it gets completely boring. In fact, it's so boring, I put it this way. It's 99% boredom punctuated by 1% sheer terror, okay? And you just saw the 1% on your screen. I'm not going to tell you about the other times, all right? Just the 1% there. And you, but 99% of the time, I'm trying to fight fatigue and stay awake. And you can picture it, you know, I'm staring at the instruments. They're staring back at me. And I'm, I'm watching some of you elbowing each other right now. Are you asking what airline did that guy say he worked for again? <laughs> Delta. <laughs> Avoid Delta. Okay, good. Write that. Just write that down, right? And, but I'm just being honest with you. you know, and it, it, sometimes the sun's beating in through the window, and, and you feel like an old lizard on a rock in the summer. All you want to do is just take a big yawn and lay back for a nap, but you can't. Right? You've got to stay awake up there. And, and, uh, and I, when I get into those moments in life, I told you all week I've got ADD, right? And, and I get distracted very easily. So I tend to get into trouble when I have a little too much time on my hands. Now, to illustrate the silly things that sometimes happen up in the cockpit of an airplane, uh, and especially to me, uh, I need to take you back a number of years. We were coming back from Los Angeles to Boston, and that was my normal route in those days. And uh, we were at 37,000 feet somewhere over Kansas. Because I was looking out the window, and it was just as flat as could be on the earth down below. And as I'm staring out the window, I started counting all those crop circles down below. All right, that's a bad idea. That's a really bad idea. It's like counting sheep when you're tired. You know, the next thing that's going to happen is your head's going to hit the dashboard. But I'm staring out the window, I'm counting all these crop circles, and all of a sudden a thought occurred to me that I hadn't thought about in decades, and it caught me off guard, and it was funny. And I started giggling, I started laughing, I started totally losing it. Did you ever have that happen to you? Yes. Right? You're in a crowd and everybody's got their arms folded, like, dude, what is your problem? And you just can't get it out? Right? And so it's just me and the captain up in the cockpit, and every 30 seconds or so I'd start to calm down, you know, he'd say, Steve, what's so funny? And I couldn't get it out. Another wave of laughter would rush over me, and I'd lose it all over again. So after about three minutes, right, a really long time, uh, he finally, one more time, goes, Steve, what in the world are you laughing about? I said, all right, are you ready? Mrs. McWilliams. And he looked at me, like, you're going to look at me right now, like, what? I said, all right, let me explain Mrs. McWilliams. Mrs. McWilliams was my fourth grade public school teacher. Now, you homeschoolers, all right, you're glad you're homeschooled. Mrs. McWilliams was my fourth grade public school teacher, and Mrs. McWilliams was not a nice lady. In fact, this gal was mean and rotten to the core, all right? And she had this ruler, and she had taped it together with masking tape, and three rulers that she had taped together, and she used that thing like an assault stick in the classroom, right? And you never heard her coming. If, you're, if your fingers were over the edge of your desk like that, that was one of her pet peeves. She'd come over with that big old stick of hers, and she'd whack your knuckles, and man, that would hurt when she would do that, right? And she would, she, you had to keep your eyes straight forward the whole time, and she would troll around behind the students. Her shoes didn't squeak or anything. I don't know how she got away with it. And it, you know, if you were out of line, boy, she'd come and whack you with that thing. And, and uh, now, I, I want you to come into the classroom with me for just a minute. You're an eight-year-old boy. It's early November. It's just outside Detroit, Michigan. The first snow of the season is just starting to gently fall outside. Where do you want to be right now? Yeah, trapped with Mrs. McWilliams <laughs> or outside with the first snow. Now, the first I realized that Mrs. McWilliams was somewhere in my vicinity was when the pain radiated from the side of my leg up to my brain. And she had taken that big old switch of hers, whacked me in the side of the leg for all she was worth, and then she leaned over and she hissed this in my ear, and I'll never forget what she said that day. She said, Stevie Scheibner, you'll never make a living staring out the window. <laughs> she was wrong. <laughs> Yay, for, yay for me, right? Yay for all the eight-year-old boys out there, right? You know, and so vindication came for an eight-year-old boy 40-plus years later at somewhere over Kansas. 
All right, we needed to laugh after that little dark film, didn't we? Absolutely true story. And, uh, and by the way, if, if you want to, to hear, there are more Mrs. McWilliams stories. We don't have time for them right now. But if you would like a book later on, come back to the table. I'll sign a book for you. And uh, ask me about Mrs. McWilliams then, because I, I don't mind throwing that lady under the bus at all. <laughs> did he really say that? Yeah, he did. He did. Okay, so uh, now, what about that other question? You know, how, how has your life changed, or why did God spare your life on 9-11? And that's a much harder question to answer. You don't just wake up, you know, one morning and have an answer to that question. Um, it's a process, uh, and I think the process for me over these many years has been telling my story. Uh, God thought that was important for me to tell because, quite honestly, each one of us has a God story to tell. Now, my God story is pretty dramatic. It was on TV and a lot of us remember where we were on that day. It's not the only God story I have, but it's the, it's the main one for sure. Uh, but you know what? God has given you a story as well, and you've got to tell your God story. And your God story might not be as dramatic as mine, but it's no less important for you to tell it because there's somebody that needs to hear it. That's, what it's, that's what's so important about a personal testimony. There's somebody that needs to hear about your struggles, your walk with the Lord, how you came to Christ, how you've walked with Him since. Right? All those things are... are critically important. So why did God spare my life on 9-11? Well, the Lord kept bringing me back to one passage in Scripture over and over and over again, and I couldn't figure out why. And it was John chapter 21. So if you got your Bibles this morning, turn to John 21. Turn to John 21. And because uh, as I wrestled with the question, how has my life changed? Why did God spare my life? Why am I here? The big picture questions of life. John 21 emerged as more and more and more important over time. And I finally realized something. I thought, what if we asked the disciples the question, how has your life changed after their major life event? What was their major life event? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. You talk about a major life event. That's also our major life event, is it not? You know, 9-11, JFK being shot, Reagan being shot, all of those things pale in significance to the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. And it occurred to me, you know what? How did the disciples respond to the resurrection? Maybe there's some answers for me as I'm wrestling with my dilemma and my major life event. And sure enough, here it is, right in John 21. This is after the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and the Lord is going to now speak to these guys. So let me, uh, let me read the first four verses to get started in John 21. After these things, Jesus manifests himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and he manifests himself in this way. Stop right there at verse 1. Let me say something to the young people in the room. All of these guys, they're all teenagers. Jesus met them when they were 14, 15 years old. Now they're 17, 18 years old. Just, I, want to, I want you to put that into context. Right? He poured himself into who? Teenagers. Very important time of life. Very important time. Okay? So it, it, verse 1. Therefore, uh, they were, there were together Simon Peter and Thomas called Didymus and Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee and the sons of Zebedee and two others of his disciples. So for those of you who are math challenged, that's seven Seven of the remaining 11 disciples. Don't think I'm off base here. Judas has hung himself. So now there's only 11. Seven of them are here in the scene. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, well, we'll come with you. And they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. But when the day was now breaking, Jesus stood on the beach, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. The stage is now set for Jesus to teach one final lesson to seven of the remaining disciples. What's that lesson that was so important to him that he came back in his glorified body to directly teach it to them? The lesson is this. He needs to get them and me and us to stop living like someday saints and start living more like borrowed time believers. What's the difference between a someday saint and a borrowed time believer? Well, a someday saint is that museum piece of a Christian who's always going to get around to it someday. Whatever it is that God wants them to do with their lives, they're going to do it, but they're just not going to do it now because they've got other things they want to do, and they've got a plan for their life, and so they keep God's plan at arm's length, and they're having fun right now, and they don't want to miss out on all the fun, and someday they'll get serious about their walk with Christ, but not right now, God. They kick the can down the road. They're the king and queen of the procrastinators, and folks, we're watching our culture, our America, our world disintegrate around our ears. And when are we going to wake up and get in the game? 
we ought to be going down and storm in City Hall. And I'm not talking about violently. I'm talking about it legally and with our voices and everything else. We need to stand up for what is right in our own life and, in, in, and culturally. We need to do those things. Stop talking about them. You know, one of the things I learned at 10 years of being a pastor of a church is that my congregation continually prepared to prepare to prepare. We love the preparing to prepare to get ready to prepare to make sure we're right there so that if something ever comes along, we're prepared to do it. Killed me. All the time and money we wasted on preparing to prepare to prepare, we could have just gone out and done it. Old man. Okay. Thank you for indulging me. So Jesus now, in these first four verses, sets the stage. Now, what's a borrowed time believer? A borrowed time believer is that, is that believer that lives with a sense of urgency and purpose and passion. They know that every day on this earth is a precious gift from God. And if you're here today and you've ever been diagnosed with cancer, you've had a life-threatening illness or injury, and now something that's been introduced to my family, a traumatic brain injury, if you had anything like that, you, you know exactly what I'm talking about right now because you can mark on the calendar the day you got that diagnosis. The day you were in that car wreck. The day you should have gone to be with the Lord, but you didn't. And you know what? You're, you're trying to get the most out of every day. And not the most for you, but the most for the bigger picture, the kingdom of God and the cause of Christ. Praise the Lord for that. Praise the Lord for that. So how's the Lord going to get us to move from this someday saint mentality to this borrowed time believer sense of urgency and passion, right? Get off our duffs, get off the couch of life. How's he going to do that? He's going to ask us three questions, and the first question is this. What are you doing here? Isn't that a great question? What are you doing here? Now, don't think I'm being loose with the text here. Jesus doesn't utter a word in the first four verses. He simply implies the question, what are you doing here, by showing up. How does he do that? Remember when he first called these guys, these teenagers? He first called them back in Luke chapter 5, I think it was. He first called Peter. And uh, he called them to become fishers of what? Fishers of men. And now seven of the remaining 11 men that are uniquely qualified to be fishers of men are now out fishing for what? Fish. Not a good use of their time. There are other people, guys, that can go fishing. Curiously, these guys go back to doing the very last thing they were doing before they met Jesus. Jesus is not amused by this. And he shows up and he simply implies the question, gentlemen, what are you doing here? There's appropriate things. You know what? We're all disciples of Jesus. And if you don't feel adequate to go out and disciple somebody else, get discipled. Beg somebody to disciple you, somebody that's older than you. Sit down and say, let's open the Bible together. I I want to be qualified to lead other people to Christ, right? I want to get to that. I want to be there. It's not just for the staff and the pastors and the professionals to do. It's for all of us to do. And so, you know, what are you doing here? And this is a big picture question. I'm not talking about specifically like today in this building. I know why you're here. You're here to worship. What are you doing here on this earth? God gave you unique gifts and talents. Are you using them? Are you using your God story to the furtherance of the kingdom of God? Or are you keeping it to yourself because, well, it's nobody's, nobody really wants to hear my story? Yeah, they do. <laughs> you don't know. You haven't told it. People want to hear your story. What are you doing here? Um, there's an appropriateness to everything. A little a quick story about my mom. My mom, when she was a little girl, um, she, uh, she wanted to go to the movie theater. And, uh, and uh, she uh, said to her dad, she said, Daddy, can I, can I have 10 cents? In, I've got 10 cents. She said, I have a dime. That's all it cost back in those days. And I want to go see. There's three features playing today. I want to go to the movie theater. And her father said, uh, you may not go to the movie theater. And... Uh, but you had to know my mom. She was pretty strong-willed. And so she snuck off with her little girlfriend, and the two of them went to the movie theater. She said it was about halfway through the first film, and she said, I uh, was sitting there enjoying the film when I noticed a pair of man's shoes standing next to me. She said, I didn't have to look up. I recognized them to be my dad's one and only pair of shoes. She said, I lifted up my hand like this. My dad grabbed my hand. He walked me all the way home. She said he didn't say a word. She said, I was, I was beside myself. I wanted him to yell at me, scold me, something, didn't say a word. He just simply took me home. Why didn't he say a word? He didn't have to. See, simply by being there, he implied to my mother, you don't belong here, sweetheart. That's what Jesus is implying to these guys. Guys, you don't belong here. You got bigger fish to fry than the fish out in that boat. So at any rate, he sets up the premise now with what are you doing here. In verse 5, Jesus speaks for the first time. He, Jesus says, therefore, to them, he yells out, Children, do you have any fish? I love this. 
You ever wonder why God ever asked a question? I asked that question a couple days ago, right? Why does God ever ask a question? Jesus already knows that there's no fish out in that boat. So it's, there, it's for their benefit, right? And you also know what it's like when you're cold and tired and cranky and hungry and, and maybe a little embarrassed and you want to cut off the conversation, right? That snippy one-word answer comes out of us. So one of the guys in the boat yells this back, No! <laughs> I love this. Aren't you glad that God doesn't accept no for an answer? Think about where your walk with Christ would be if he accepted no from you the first time and then walked away. I picture Jesus puts a smile on his face, shakes his head, and says, all right, guys, I'm going to walk you down memory lane. Here we go. And so he says, hey, take that net you got in the boat, throw it on the other side. Wait, that doesn't make any sense. It's daylight. The fish can see the net. That's okay. But there's something compelling about the voice of the Lord. Remember three years prior to this, back in Luke chapter 5, Jesus had seen them all. They'd been out fishing all night, hadn't caught anything. Jesus says, throw the net on the other side. They throw the net on the other side. It fills up with fish so quickly they can hardly haul it in. Guess what they're going to do again in Luke 21? They're going to obey the voice of the Lord. They're not even sure it's him yet. They throw the, the net on the other side. It fills up with fish so quickly they can hardly haul it in. There's only one guy that fishes like this. And now everybody in the boat knows who it is on the beach. It's Jesus. Peter gets so excited right now, he jumps out of the boat and swims to shore. I love Peter. He's a great guy. See, he's soaking wet. He gets up on the beach. He's just greeting the Lord. Everybody else is rowing the boat back with the nets filled with the heavy fish. You know, thanks a lot, Peter. You know, but whatever. And they finally get back up to the beach. But Peter's a good guy. So while they get out to go greet the Lord, he's grabbing the net with the fish and he's pulling it up on the shore. You know, he's, oh, he's a strong guy and he pulls him up farther and farther. And you can see the fish flopping around and you can smell the fish and you can hear the fish. And right at this moment, Peter is reunited with Jesus in his glorified body. Folks, someday you're going to be in that moment that Peter's in right now. You're going to be face-to-face with Jesus, and you're going to see the holes in his hands and the hole in his side from the spear. You're going to see the scars on his face from the thorn of crowns. You're going to be right there. I can't wait. And in that moment, Peter stops to count the fish in the nets. In verse 11, 153 large fish, we're told. Does that strike you as odd? If you were with Jesus in his glorified body, would you stop to count the fish in the nets? See, it's a little insight to what's going on with Peter right now. Because Peter is as excited about those fish as he is about the Lord. And don't get me wrong, Peter loves Jesus. Steve loves Jesus. You love Jesus. But we get wrapped up in those things like the fish that are temporary. Right? Because in a day or two or for three, those fish are going to rot and smell and decay. You're going to have to go out and get them again, fish some more. And, and they're temporary. And many times we get focused on that which is temporary at the expense of that which is what? Eternal. The Lord is right with us right now, see. And we could be just peppering him with questions and adoring him and worshiping him and we're concerned about the fish and the nets. Jesus, none of this bypasses Jesus, by the way. He knows all of it. So the second question this morning, after what are you doing here, is what are you fishing for in life specifically? You know, each one of us has a little thing that we're fishing for, a little comfort zone that we want to get into. Maybe it's peace and quiet. Maybe it's love. Maybe it's influence. Maybe it's riches. Maybe it's power. I don't know what it is. There's about 100,000 things you could fill that blank in. What are you fishing for in this life? And only you can answer that. And if you're not sure what it is specifically you're fishing for, check your bank account and your calendar. What you spend your time and your money on is what you're really fishing for in life. Those two things know the answer to that question. What you spend your time and your money on. So I love uh, verse 12. And ladies, uh, uh, verse 12 is what I call um, man breakfast. Okay? So down in in verse 12, it says, Jesus uh, said to them, come and have breakfast. But none of the disciples ventured to question him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord. Um, Ladies, this might be shocking to you, uh, but it's very true. And the guys will know this for sure. When men go out to have breakfast together, there's no talking required. Yeah, it's, it's a wonderful, glorious thing. Um, we can go and grunt at each other for a half an hour like a bunch of cavemen. Pass the salt is about as deep as the conversation goes. Um, sometimes there's some trash talk. That's a different category of juvenile behavior. But, uh, you know, there's no talking required. And, uh, uh, and, 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 and how, how can you go out and have a good time and not talk? Years ago, my, my uh, son, he's now 28 years old, um, when he was a teenager, he and I would go out to breakfast about once a month, and mom just loved that, the fair and lovely just loved that, you know, because her, her husband and one of her older boys were bonding, you know, and we'd come back after about an hour of being out to breakfast, and we'd drive up the driveway, and her face was pressed against the window, right, she couldn't wait to, to jump us with a question, and 
So he'd go through the door, and, and uh, she'd say to him, she'd say, so, did, did you have a good time with your dad? Oh, yeah, Mom, I had a great time. Uh, so uh, she'd say, so what did you talk about, right? And he, now he looks like a, a trapped animal. He's like, oh, I, 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 don't, I didn't know there was going to be a quiz, right? He doesn't know what to say. So now I come through the door next, so now she's a little concerned because, you know, we weren't talking, right? And so uh, <laughs> she goes, did you have a good time? And I go, oh, yeah, I had a great time, round two. So what did you talk about, right? And now I'm like, honey, I, I don't know the answer to that. I mean, we, we grunt a lot, uh, you know, but we did have a good time. Trust me. It's okay. We can, we can actually bond and not, not have to talk. All right. So at any rate, here we are at man breakfast. But this is more than just a bunch of guys out at man breakfast. In fact, right now in verse uh, 12, the tension is so thick you can cut it with a knife. So thick you can cut it with a knife. And nobody, to their credit, nobody's going to be the first fool to open his mouth because it's a, one of those what I call a rut row moment where they've been caught and nobody's going to open up their mouth and be the first guy to, to admit it. And there they are just having silent man breakfast. And all you hear in the background is the flopping of the fish. Really an interesting scene right now in John 21. Do you ever wonder when these guys get it? Right, We pick on Peter a lot, don't we? Uh, because Peter's very much like us. He's thick as a brick and doesn't get it. And, and uh, we pick on Peter that way. And uh, these guys get it, here's my contention, in verse 13. Now, I call verse 13 a flyover verse. If you don't stop and linger here, you're going to miss the, the meaning altogether. Jesus came and took the bread and gave them, and the fish likewise. So you say to yourself, well, Steve, I already know what's on the menu. What's the big deal about verse 13? If you don't stop and linger here, you're going to miss it altogether. Put yourself in the shoes of these seven men. For you, when was the last time Jesus took a piece of bread, broke it, and handed it to you? See where we are right now? I'll give you a hint. It was about a week ago. And you were in a place called the Upper Room, now known as the Last Supper prior to the crucifixion and the resurrection. And he said to you what at that time? When he broke that piece of bread, he looked you in the eye and he said, this is my body broken for you. Do this as often as you gather together in remembrance of me. Nothing in there about getting together to go fishing. Everything in there about getting together to go fishing for men. And without a word, Jesus delivers the most brilliant message yet in John 21. He simply takes a piece of bread and looks these guys in the eye one after another. And if it had been me, I would have cried like a little baby. The next time we see Peter in the scriptures, he's the head of the church and he's leading thousands to faith in Christ. I think the connection was made here at the end of John. Now to drive the point home, Jesus turns to the leader of all these guys, Peter. Peter was the natural leader. And he asked Peter now that famous question that we see in, in John, uh, 21, John 21, 14, 15, 16, 16, right? Or 15 through 17. We see that famous question where he turns to, to Peter and he says, Peter, do you love me more than these? Right? You've heard that preached before. And the these he's speaking about could be any number of things. It could be the other disciples, true. It could be the distractions of life. Peter's a pretty distractible guy like me. Or it could be the 153 large fish flopping around in the nets during our silent man breakfast. I, the point is this. It, it doesn't really make a difference what it is. If there's something you love more than Jesus, that's a problem, and that's what Jesus is trying to get to. If I had to vote, and, and again, don't hold my feet to the fire on this. If I had to vote, I would say it's the fish. I think Jesus took uh, Peter by the shoulder, walked him over by the fish that he had just counted during our silent man breakfast, and said, Peter, do you love me more than these? Just curious. And they go back through that exchange a couple times because Peter holds back on him. He's holding back, and, and Jesus wants more. And finally, Jesus wounds him because he asks him the question a third time, and, 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 he, and he equivocates to what Peter is saying, and, and Peter gets it. it. He makes a connection with Peter now after that third question, and Peter says, yes, Lord, you know I love you. And at that point, Peter's got to make a decision about the quality of his relationship with Jesus. It's hugely, hugely important at this moment. But the third question for us this morning is this. What do you love more than Jesus? That's a fair question, isn't it? it? Can I be honest with you? Most of the time it's me. I love me more than I love Jesus. And I'm just being honest with you. Don't beat up on this. This is a no judgment zone. But I'm being true with you. Um, I take care of me pretty well. And I look out for my needs. And I, I'm ashamed to tell you how many times over the 42 years I've been walking with the Lord on this earth that I've kept his plan for me at arm's length because Steve had a better plan, like that someday saint. 
I need to live more like that borrowed time believer. The Lord brought all three of these questions into my life on September 11, 2001. How did he do that? By showing me my own mortality. I'm here today to tell you I know what it's like to have somebody die in my place. Not once, but twice. And once was enough. Tom McGinnis, the pilot who sat in my seat that day, Tom would be the first guy to tell you that he did not die for Steve's sins. Now, how can I say that with confidence? Here's a silver lining on this little dark story of mine. Tom had a solid testimony of faith in Jesus Christ. Isn't that great news? And on September 11th, 2001, Tom went straight from that bloody cockpit into the arms of the Lord. But the other who died in my place, and the other who died for Tom, and the other who died for you, all of us, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he hung, and he bled, and he suffered on a cross to pay a price that he and he alone was uniquely qualified to pay. You look for the definition of propitiation? That's it. Jesus Christ hung on the cross to pay a price that you and I couldn't pay. Why did he do it? Number one, out of a deep and abiding love and a satisfaction of God's justice. That's exactly why Jesus did it. God's justice had to be satisfied. God can't overlook sin. It's got to be paid for. And it was. You say, well, Steve, I, I hear what you're saying, but you know what? If, if you knew the stuff I was into and the things I've done in my life and the things even I'm currently doing, there's no way God could love me. There's, there's no way. I, I just, I've done so many awful things. Can I put that in perspective for you? God's omniscient, is he not? He knows everything. He's outside of time. He knows everything from the beginning of time all the way to the end of the time and everything in between. That means that God knows every sin you have ever committed in your life and every sin you're currently committing and every sin you ever will commit. He knew all that ahead of time before he sent his son to die on the cross. How can you keep that type of love at arm's length? You're being proud and self-serving when you do that. God already knew and he already sent his son. That's how much he loves you. Oh, my word. The second reason Jesus went to the cross was out of a deep and abiding love for you and me, the object of his affection. That's how much he loves you. Again, how can you keep that type of love at arm's length? I believe that type of love requires, even demands, a response on our part. So how would you handle those three questions? What are you doing here, big picture? What are you fishing for specifically in your relationships? And number three, what do you love more than Jesus? And by the way, when you find the answer to that third one, what do you love more than Jesus, the other two questions just fall into place. Because life makes sense at that point. Now, you may be here today and you've been keeping God at arm's length for some time. Maybe uh, you got other people convinced that you're a follower of Jesus, but you know in your heart you're not. Uh, you're just going through the motions because you want to get out of your house as fast as you can or, you know, wh whatever the reason is. I can't come up with all the different reasons. But you know what? You, you're sitting here today and you go, Steve, I didn't realize that Jesus substituted for me. He paid that price for me that I couldn't pay. And now I, I want to respond to him. I want to become a Christian. I want Jesus to be Lord and Savior of my life. I want him to forgive me of my sin. That transaction took free place for me when I was 17 years old, as you all well know, at 6.50 p.m. in Wendy Frank's driveway. All right, when I, I sat there and I, I prayed a quick prayer, I closed my eyes and I said, Lord, I've been running from you my whole life. And I said, Jesus, I want to ask you to come into my life to forgive me of my sin. That's number one. Number two, I want to ask you to be Lord and master of my life. I'm not sure where that's going to go, but I want you to lead my life. I want to become a Christian right now. And at that moment, the Holy Spirit indwelt my body. I became a born-again child of God, right? And I, and I became a citizen of heaven at that moment. And the journey has taken me these 42-plus years um, since then on some really incredible things. But one thing that's been true about the 42 years is God has never left me, and he's never forsaken me, and he never will. You can take that to the bank. Let's bow for a word of prayer. Father, thank you so much for the privilege of being able to share my God story this morning. And I'm grateful for um, these folks, and we've gotten to know each other this week, and really looking forward, Lord, to coming back in November of uh, 2022, Lord willing. And, uh, but in the meantime, Lord, we've got something to deal with here right now today, and that's this. I'm not naive enough to think that there aren't 
more than a couple of people here today in this room that have never surrendered to you, and that surrender is the right word. They've never asked you to forgive their sin in a meaningful or significant way. Maybe they did when they were little, but it's gotten away from them. And maybe you just want to nail it down today, and make sure. Yeah, that's, there's, that's, that's a beautiful thing. If you want to make sure, absolutely make sure. For the very first time, surrender your heart to Jesus Christ and ask him to be Lord and Master of your life. So I'm going to give you the opportunity to respond right now. If you're here today, and just with the uplifted hand, just say, Steve, I would like to receive Jesus Christ. I would like to ask him to forgive me of my sin and be Lord and Master of my life for the first time. Is there anybody here today? Just slip up your hand. Is there anyone? All right. I see one little hand over here. All right. Mom and Dad, we'll talk to you about that afterwards and follow up with your son. All right. Anybody else? All right, how about you now? I'm going to take you all at your word. And uh, I don't believe in emotional invitations. Um, You know, if you've got questions you want to ask, grab me by the sleeve afterwards. I have nothing to do other than talk to you today. And I would love, or or grab John by the sleeve and say, hey, John, I I want to talk a little bit more. And John would love to open the Bible with you. So would I. And uh, and, and show you in the scriptures where it says that you can be born again. Uh, Now, you are born again. You've been walking with the Lord for some time, but you've been living a little too much like that someday saint. And and as I've been talking this morning, the Lord's been giving you kind of that little nudge in the, in the ribs and, and saying, hey, you know what, uh, I need you to live like a borrowed time believer and less like a someday saint. And you just want somebody to pray for you in the closing prayer. You go, Steve, I, I, I pretty much know what I need to do, or, uh, but I just, I just need the courage to do it, and, and I, I need somebody to pray for me in the closing prayer. I would love to do that. Just slip up your hand and say, Steve, just pray for me. All right, I see a hand back there. Anybody else? I see a couple more hands. All right, praise the Lord. Hey, there's a bunch of hands. Great. God's good. See, you can put them down. Anybody else? Right, don't be bashful. This is, you know, no, you can all ask for prayer, right? The Lord, just pray for me. Yeah, we absolutely. Right? We just get proud. We just don't even want to kind of halfway put up our hands. You know, we ought to be screaming to the Lord, Lord, please. So, Lord, thank you for those who have lifted up their hands today. And, and uh, I pray, Lord, for them specifically, uh, that you would give them the insight and the courage to take that next step. Remind them, Lord that uh, your light is a light unto their next step, not the whole thing. Don't let them get overwhelmed. Sometimes seeking forgiveness or whatever it is seems overwhelming at first, but just do the next thing. Elizabeth Elliot used to say that so wonderfully. Just do the next thing. Lord, give us the courage to do the right thing and to do the next thing. Maybe it's that person sitting next to us. We need to say the words, will you please forgive me? And become annoyingly liberal in that process. I don't know what it is, Lord, this week. Maybe it's our children. Maybe it's our parents. Whatever it is, Lord, give us the courage to do that. Thank you, Lord, so much for the privilege of being able to share my God story. I pray that each of us would walk away from this session this week uh, and going out and sharing our God story with a lost and dying world. We pray all these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. John?